funerals. And if you hear of funerals coming up here, we would love it if you would pray and intercede for the families. Because many of these families, they, they don't go to church, never been in a church before, and it's their first opportunity. We had a service here last week for a little 10-year-old girl that died of cancer. And uh, I think we had 450, 500 people in here that probably never walked into a church before. And these are wonderful opportunities to share hope and to open doors and point people to Jesus. And, uh, you know, God is full of surprises, and it's one of the big surprises that we had when we first built this building. Well, if you're surprised that I'm here, so am I. Um, <laughs> my friend Steve was supposed to speak to us today, but he, he came down very ill, and uh, so he's ill, and, and, and I'm up. So um, my family's at the lake, and I'm talking to you, but I'm happy to be talking to you, sort of. It's good. <laughs> You're great people. I love it here. Thank you. Thank you very much. You get a free CD of this after the service. <laughs> Might even sign it. Not sure. You know, a few weeks ago, I had mentioned to you that Pastor Julie and I had the privilege of speaking at uh, the 100th anniversary for Prairie Bible College. And it was a wonderful time. Julie spoke Friday night, and I spoke Sunday morning. Um, one of the surprises was um, Jason Kenny. He showed up and came to dinner on Saturday night, and then he had some um, platform time on Sunday morning. And I just want to say to you this, that the message he gave on Sunday, or on Saturday night, rather, it was Saturday night, the message he gave was as good as any message you'd hear in most churches in Canada on any given Sunday. And I'm so grateful for leaders in our country that are unashamed to name the name Jesus. He spoke from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me tell you a couple of things he said. He said, we need to stay true to the word of God. He said, we need to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, souls, minds, and strength. We need to pass that faith on to our children and on to our grandchildren. He said, we need to stay rooted in the eternal word and faith in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine a leader in Canada saying that? And then he said, he said, we, we need to impact the culture with, with the gospel and not let the culture impact us. And I walked away from that just grateful. Grateful that there's still people in positions of leadership in our country that are unashamed to name the name Jesus and to stand on the word of God. I don't know what you think about his politics. I don't really care what you think. You don't care what I think. What I am saying is here's a man that stood up publicly and declared Jesus. And then he said after, I was talking to him after, he said, would you pray for me? And would you tell your people to pray? And I said, yes, I'll tell them that we ought to pray for you. And as I drove home, I remember the scripture that said, you know, we ought to pray for our leaders, those in authority over us in our city, the mayor, the city council, our government in Alberta and across Canada. I thought how often we criticize them and we go after them, but I wonder how often we actually intercede for them. And the reason God says we ought to pray for them in the Timothy passage is simply this, because he wants to grant them repentance. He wants to gift them with eternal life. He wants to gift Mr. Trudeau with eternal life. He has a place for Mr. Trudeau and his family at his table, and somebody needs to intercede so the man turns and puts his faith and trust in Christ. It's a very serious thing how Christians handle leadership. You know, we're to pray, and we're to respect them and give them the honor they're due, and it's a very serious thing to try and and uh, touch in a wrong way somebody that God has put in a position. Uh, David tried to take a leader out, and he was so conscience-stricken. He said, far be it from me that I should take somebody out that God's put in there. When God wants to take someone out, he'll take them out. And as Christians, we need to remember that. Um, our job is to pray and intercede. God exalts and God can take out. That's not our job. All that to sort of segue into what I want to talk to you about this morning, which is this, that we, although we have some godly leaders, we 
by and large, live in a time of deconstruction, deconstruction, where we want to take leaders out, we, we knock the statutes down, and we try to edit, and we try to revise history. One of the problems with that is that we lose some good role models. We lose some good role models. And you know, in the life of faith, in the Christian life, it's so important to have good and godly role models. And I'm so grateful in my life that I've had good and godly role models. And during this summer series, we're bringing forward some people that in very many different ways are good and godly role models. Some of them you've known and some of you maybe you haven't known. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see a whole list of names that God has put there because they're godly and because we ought to shape our lives after them. Um, people that we know and people that we don't know. Some are named and some are unnamed. Then when you flip over to Revela or Revelation, Hebrews chapter 13, um, you come to verse 8, which says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But did you know the verse that comes before it? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Imitate their faith and consider the outcome of their way of life because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we've looked at some of these hidden, more hidden figures this summer, I hope that you've been encouraged. I hope you've been uh, challenged by their lives. And I hope you've learned to put into practice some of the things that we're learning. It's been so uh, interesting for me to listen to Pastor Jordan and Pastor Julie and, and Pastor Rob and, and to consider the people they brought forward. They've been refreshing Intriguing and life-changing for me. So today, as I was pondering what to talk to you about when my good friend Steve went down, it struck me that I'd like to talk to you about a man named Simon. Simon of Cyrene. He's the man that helped carry the cross of Jesus. Simon Cyrene. Um, I don't know if you know anything about him. I didn't know much about him. But for some reason, he just landed in my brain as I prayed about what to pray, about what to say. And so we're going to talk about Simon of Cyrene, the man that helped carry Jesus' cross. When you read the story of the crucifixion, he seems so incidental, so random, so whatever. But he's presumably noteworthy because as I found out, maybe you already know, Three of the four gospel writers record the fact that Simon of Cyrene carried the cross of Jesus. I mean, if it was just incidental, why would all three record it? Why would the Holy Spirit uh, kind of run a highlighter through him three times? Surely there's something we can learn from him. So let me read you the three verses. One is in Matthew 27 and verse 32. It says, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Then over in Mark, each one of them add just a little bit of a nuance to it, which is intriguing. So they're, they're going out to the place of the skull, place of crucifixion. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him compelled him, seized him, made him carry the cross. Then Luke adds his bit in Luke 23. As the soldiers led him away, Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him and made him carry it. And Luke adds this bit behind Jesus. So you all had a different bit, don't they? You have Matthew and then then Mark adds, oh, by the way, Simon, he was the father of Rufus and Alexander. And then Luke says in, a, in what we would almost think a throwaway word or two, uh, we carried it behind Jesus. I think those are intriguing scriptures. And um, they're brief, yet put together. To me, they seem significant. And they strike connection with other scriptures and open up fascinating possibilities when you think about them for a little while. So let me try and... Um, put his story together for you, some of which is uh, admittedly conjecture, but not without strong warrant from other scriptures that play into this story. And I'll try and paint Simon's story in three different scenes. Scene one, Simon 
and Good Friday. Simon on Good Friday. It's probably between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning on Good Friday. And most likely the 11th of April, our date, A.D. 32. And as we're standing by the city gate in old Jerusalem, we hear um, a loud commotion from inside the city. It's, um, it's loud, and there's strange cries, and there's clearly um, a lot of uh, things going on. And we're trying to get a glimpse of what's happening when, when we see a procession coming out of the old city gate. And there emerges this strange procession of disorderly, um, gloating, shouting, weeping people uh, with three criminals who were going out to what was called Skull Hill, the place of the skull, to be crucified. And we wonder what's going on, and, and um, we, we listen and we watch, and, and we recognize that, you know, when a, in that culture, when a criminal was condemned, he was led away to crucifixion, and he would be placed in the middle of four Roman soldiers. And the accusation would be hung around his neck. Um, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, or whatever the accusation was. Um, they, the cross beam of the cross would be on the criminal's back. The, the main post would already be in the ground, but the cross beam he would have to carry. And they would go um, to, uh, on the longest route possible to the place of crucifixion. So as many as possible might see these people and take warning from them. And it was another way of humiliating the victims. So as long a route as possible. But, but this crowd seemed different than others that had gone out to be crucified because although there were three criminals, everybody was fixated on one, the one in the middle, Jesus. And we noticed in the crowd, as we looked, that there were people that usually weren't in a crowd like that. For example, there were religious leaders. In fact, as you look around the crowd, some of Israel's greatest religious leaders were there. And the expression on their faces just took your breath away. They were gloating. They were hurling insults. They almost seemed excited that this man was condemned to death. And then there were so many women in the crowd. And they were weeping and they were wailing and they were crying out. And they were following along. And there was a young guy Found out later his name was John, but he was following along. And then there were Roman, Roman soldiers. They, they seemed to care nothing for this man in the middle, Jesus. In fact, it looked like he'd been severely beaten and abused. Well, at some point in this procession, Jesus stumbles with the cross on his back, and he can't go on. Roman laws required that the the criminal carry his own cross. It's the most humiliating way to do it. But he couldn't carry on. But they had to carry on because they were charged with crucifying this man, and they had to do it. So how to get Jesus and the cross to the place of the skull? Well, a man apparently named Simon was coming in from the country, and it says they, they compelled him. In fact, when it says he came in from the country... One of the things it means is he had absolutely nothing to do with what preceded these events. He had nothing to do with what preceded these events. And they seized him and forced him to carry Jesus' cross. In, in that world, the government had absolute control over you and what they said went. And you couldn't, well, you couldn't do what a lot of us do. Um, we, we couldn't protest the way that some of us protest because it would cost your life. You just had to do it. And they compelled him. They seized him. He had no choice but to carry the cross. So I read those three accounts. I wondered why the Holy Spirit had them named. I mean, seems random, seems incidental. If I was writing the story, I'd probably say, you know, there was a guy coming in from the country, they seized him and made him carry the cross. I wouldn't want to take the spotlight off Jesus, but, but he's named Simon. Not only does the Holy Spirit name him, he names this town, Cyrene, which would be in North Africa, near where we would say uh, Tripoli is, Libya. And not only does it name his town, but Mark talks about his family, his boys, Rufus and Alexander. Seems important to the Holy Spirit that we know this man has a name, 
in a town in a family. And I would have written, there's this guy. I made him carry the cross. Holy Spirit says, whoa, wait a minute. This guy's name was Simon. And he was from Cyrene. And he had a family. In fact, his two boys were Rufus and Alexander. You ever wonder why the Holy Spirit does things like that? Why do I need to know that? Well, Cyrene, if you checked it out, it'd be easy to do in a good Bible dictionary or whatever, you, you'd find out that uh, Cyrene had a large number of Jews living there, but a third of Cyrene was Jews that had relocated um, to that area of Libya. In fact, um, it, it's interesting, Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, tells us that in Jerusalem, there was a separate synagogue for Alexandrian and Cyrenian Jews. And it seems to be that if you were a Cyrenian Jew or Alexandrian Jew, that once in a lifetime, it would be in your bucket list that you would travel from Cyrene to Jerusalem for the great feasts to be able to be there to celebrate. And Simon presumably is coming. A trip of a lifetime. Dream that he's had forever. Be able to worship in Jerusalem at the synagogue and in Acts chapter 6, you can read about their synagogue, um, to come and worship there and be there for Passover and, and, and the great Pentecost feast. And he, 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 he comes in and he's, he's on his way and probably with a heart to worship God, so he understands him at least, and, and he's saved a lot of money up and now he's, now he's there and he's, he's almost there for the Passover feast and he encounters this procession. And he's um, compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. It's interesting, right after the, the verse in Luke, I just want to read it to you again. Uh, in, in Luke, it says, the soldiers led him away. They seized Simon, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him, made him carry it behind Jesus. Then it says, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children, and so on. Seems to be that Simon's carrying this cross in front of this man who's dripping blood everywhere. This man stops. He turns around. He looks at the women. He says, you know, don't weep and wail for me. For yourself and your children, weep and wail. And, and I, I can't help but wonder if at that point, he doesn't turn and look straight into Simon's eyes, then turns back. I think if he did, Simon would never forget that look. I don't think he ever did. I think the scripture makes clear he didn't. So that's scene one. I want to, I want to give you scene two, if I could. It's Simon at Pentecost. We have Simon at Good Friday. What about Simon at Pentecost? And here's where I admittedly make some conjecture, but I think I'm on solid ground. See, for Simon to travel that far for Passover would be highly unlikely that he wouldn't stay for the great Pentecost feast. If you're going to spend that much time and money, you could probably do it once in a lifetime. You'd be there for Passover. You'd also stay for Pentecost, and I think he did. In fact, it's interesting to me when you read about the lineup of people at Pentecost. It says they were staying in Jerusalem, this is Acts 2, um, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And it begins to, it begins to list them. There, there's Parthians, Medes, Elamites, res <clears throat> residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. I mean, it, it, it says that there were at least one or two people from Cyrene. I'll bet you Simon was in that crowd. And I wonder what it would have been like for Simon. I mean, for, for those six or seven weeks between Passover and Pentecost, the things that must have gone through his mind, the, the awesome and, and uh, frightening things that happened 
when they actually put Jesus on the cross that he would have witnessed. He would have witnessed the sky going dark. He would have witnessed a whole lot of stuff. And, and boy, for, for the next few weeks, his mind would be turned upside down. And I'm sure he's, and then he hears rumors that this man they took from the cross and put in the grave, they couldn't find his body anymore, is gone. And he's, he's trying to figure out what happened. There are rumors that the disciples stole it, but nobody could find the disciples. The, the Roman soldiers didn't. Like, what happened to the body? And all of this stuff would be going through Simon's mind. And, 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 and then at Pentecost, he bumps into another crowd. And everybody's gathered around a few speakers. And he, he makes his way to the front. And he looks. And it's not the religious leaders. It's just a, it's a few young guys in ordinary clothes. They're talking about this Jesus that was crucified and it's making sense to some and no sense to the rest. And then a, one that looked more like a leader steps forward. His name was Peter. And Peter begins to preach. And he tells them that this Jesus that they crucified was God's son. And that when he was on the cross, he was paying our debt of sin. And, and at three days later, God raised him from the dead and that he's alive. And I think all the lights began to go on in Simon. The Holy Spirit would have lit him up. And he was beginning to put it together. And I think it was Pentecost when Simon received new life. Became a follower. Not just carrying a cross behind, but a heart follower of Jesus. Scene three. Simon back at home in Cyrene. I can only imagine what that would have been like. Can you imagine him going back home <clears throat> to his wife and two boys? How, how he must have sat down with his family and just spilled out everything that he'd seen and heard? I was, no emails, no texts. I mean, it, it, this is the first time they've ever heard it. I was, I was on my way into Jerusalem from the country and, and, and they're leading these guys out to be executed and they made me carry the cross of one. It was horrible. It was humiliating. He, he, he hardly looked human. Then they nailed him on a cross and all these things happened and, and, and I waited around and, and when I got to Pentecost, some guy named Peter stood up and he put it all together for me and I I trusted him, and I called on him, and I was baptized, and I was saved, and I got new life, you guys. And his boys and his wife accepted Christ. And Simon shared the good news. How do I know? Well, Mark is the one that says, Simon of Cyrene, father of Rufus and Alexander. Why would he say that? He would only say that if Rufus and Alexander were well known to the Christian community. That's why he would say that. Why doesn't Matthew say that? Why doesn't Luke? Because Mark, tradition strongly suggests, was written in Rome, and the first readers would have been Romans. And the Roman church Rufus and Alexander and their mom, they were well-known in the Roman church. They were. Somehow it seems like Simon wasn't well-known. He probably died maybe shortly after the events of Pentecost and coming to Christ because Mark says, you might not know Simon, but you know his boys, Rufus and Alexander. You know what? Simon was their dad, and he was the one that carried the cross. If you go to Romans chapter 16, um, Paul is greeting all these people at Rome. And then he says, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who's been a mother to me too. The only Rufus in the New Testament is the Rufus in the Gospels, and he's mentioned again here. It's the only one in the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? Greet Rufus. Somehow they must have moved to Rome. Where's Simon? Probably in heaven. Where's Alexander? Well, if you read church history and tradition, you'll find out that Alexander was an outspoken witness for Christ and was one of the first early Christian missionary martyrs. So you're left with Rufus and his mom, but they are well known in the church. And get that, the Apostle Paul says, you know what? His mom, Simon's wife, she's been a mother to me too. 
He talked about the impact of a godly life and the impact of the gospel. Um, Simon just shares the good news. His boys eat it up. His wife comes to Christ. They become influential in the church of Rome and greatly impactive in the life of the great apostle Paul. Um, I don't think it's any mistake that the Holy Spirit for us puts three times in the text, Simon, he carried a cross. And his boys were Rufus and Alexander. And Mark says, you know them. They're well known in the church, the church in Rome. Um, I could conjecture more, but I won't. But if you read Acts carefully, what you'll find out by the time you get to Acts 11 is that a church of Christians had been established in Cyrene. And great godly leaders, missionaries, speakers, they moved out from Cyrene and went up to Antioch. And it says, men from Cyrene in Antioch, Acts 11, they led people to Jesus. They led Gentiles to Christ. Like, I don't know what you think, but I, I don't think this is all coincidence. It seems to me that this man, Simon, who seems so incidental to the story, ends up being a pretty big player in the spread of the gospel throughout his world and right down to today. Well, that's his story as I can piece it together. I guess the only question left would be, what, what might the Holy Spirit want to teach us through Simon of Cyrene? I thought about that. And I'm driving in this morning from the lake, and I've I landed on two things that I'd like to share with you. Now, you, you can come up with a lot more. But here's two things I think the Holy Spirit might want to teach us from Simon of Cyrene. One would be this. It's from Luke 23, again. And it's that little bit about Simon carried the cross behind Jesus. It's not a throwaway word. Luke adds it. Luke's actually the one that, that says in Luke 9:23. Luke records Jesus saying, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he has to take up his cross daily, come after me. Take up his cross daily and come after me. Isn't that interesting? It seems to me that what you have in Luke 23, 26 with Simon, I think what Luke is suggesting is this is what discipleship looks like. This is what discipleship looks like. It looks like Simon. Looks like Simon, who puts the cross on his back and follows Jesus. Only you do it every day, day after day after day. It's, um, well, it's a dying to yourself, is what it is. It's every day getting up, taking up the shame, taking up all that Jesus means for the world out there and identifying publicly with him and following after him, dying daily. I think Luke is suggesting that's, look at Simon. That's what discipleship looks like. Look at Simon. That's what Jesus had in mind when he said, if you want to come after me and be my disciple, take up your cross daily and follow me. But I, there might be a bit more in that. I think that's an everyday thing, and I think it's right. But I also thought to myself, it's also a beautiful, painful picture of discipleship. It's a beautiful, painful picture of discipleship because there's times where, like Simon, we find ourselves in situations we would never choose to be in. It just happens. Disaster. Tragedy. A sickness. A cancer. Loss. Relational brokenness. Stuff we would never choose. But it's part of following, and we take up our cross, and we, we follow Jesus through the darkest valleys of life. What seemed to be the deepest of humiliation and suffering for Simon, God turned to the greatest good. Sometimes we don't understand the path that we're called to walk or what happens to us or why. But as we faithfully, day after day, beautifully and painfully, take up our cross to follow Jesus. Though it hurts, though it's humiliating, whatever else it might be, 
you can be sure that God does not waste one thing in the life of his followers, and he'll turn it to the greatest good, like he did with Simon. That's one thing that struck me. Here's the other thing. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. I thought of Paul who said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to everybody who believes, to the Jew first, then of the Gentile. And, and, and later on, he says, for everyone that calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Everyone. Everyone that calls on Jesus will be saved. Not everyone that goes to crossroads, not everyone that goes to a Christian church, just blanket statement, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will have their name written down in the book of life. Power of the gospel. The gospel hasn't changed from the day Simon shared it in his home to today. You know what's changed? Our confidence in the gospel. That's what's changed. Our confidence in the gospel has been eroded. It's the culture out there. Maybe it's the sexual ethic out there. But I don't know what it is, but something has undermined our confidence in the gospel. And it's really difficult for a lot of Christians to say, in Red Deer in Central Alberta, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'll name him publicly. Because I believe that the good news about Jesus is still the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The gospel hasn't changed. You know, I told you that Julie and I were out at Three Hills, and I was a little freaked out by it. So I was glad she was going up to bat first on the Friday night. So on Saturday morning, I texted her. I said, Julie, how'd it go? She said, you would not believe how old these people are. <laughs> I said, oh, good, I'll fit right in. <laughs> she said, like, this, like, there's nobody, I don't think, under 60. They're really old. And, and um, then I realized, of course, it's reunions from a 1,000 years ago. They're all, they're all there. So when I spoke on Sunday morning, I spoke on one of my passions. I said, you guys, we are in danger of losing the next generation. And you know what? Most people your age, Christians, they check out. I said they check out for half a year. And their kids and grandkids are going to hell in a handbasket here. I said we collect seashells and go to Southern Gospel concerts and go to pie socials, and we're losing a whole generation at home because you guys are checking out. I said, Go on a holiday and play golf. But don't make it the main thing. The main thing is the good news of Jesus Christ that has to be passed on to our children and to our grandchildren. And if you don't do it, who's going to do it? It was dead silent in there. I didn't know if they were going to stone me or what. Mark Maxwell, he's the president. He, he asked me back to speak again. So I, I think it was okay. But um, I grieve deeply over my generation that's lost the confidence in the gospel and made it all about me. Julie Kavanaugh says these things much more graciously than I do. But that's my heart. So I get back home and I receive an email from a man that was there named Henry. Can I, just, can I tell you what he said? He said, I turned 90 in September. Tell us how to write emails. I turned 90 in September. I just want you to know, I just want you know, I am all in, he says. I'm all in. Under the Holy Spirit's direction, I've handed out in my seniors' homes Gospels of John. Most recently, I gave one to a 100-year-old gentleman. He said he would read it. He had some United Church attendants. I met him a few days later, and he had the booklet in his pocket with a bookmark in it. He said to me, Henry, you didn't give this to me. The Lord did. I talked to him again in a few days, and it was clear he had received and believed Christ. Isn't that amazing? 90 years old, leading a 101-year-old man to Christ. Two weeks later, the ambulance was taking him out of our senior's residence. And, to, and an attending care lady returned short me and told me that two minutes after arriving at the hospital, his heart stopped, and I knew he was present with the Lord Jesus. Isn't that a great story? 90 years old, and he still believes the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. 
in his radar. I hope we still have that confidence. I do. Because I'll tell you what, there are more people in this city yet to come to Christ than have ever come to Christ before. I am absolutely convinced with every cell in my body that the Lord Jesus will not let about 90,000 people in this city go to hell in a handbasket. He bled and he died for them and he entrusted us with the eternal gospel and if we don't take it out there, who will? Simon just shared what happened to him and his family, whole family came to Christ. Have you told your kids and grandkids how you came to Christ? Have you told them how you came to Christ? Have you told them the difference he's made in your life? Do you pray for them every day? Do you hang in with them? You know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm stepping out of this rule at the end of next year, it, it, I just want to be at rinks more often. Like, I want to be at more games. I just want to be out at the farm a bit more with the kids. I want to be on the island with our kids there. Like, that's the biggest thing that's been entrusted to me is my children and grandchildren. I don't know about you, but I'm all in. Um, so here's what you can do. Jeremy had us hold up our hands with the names on them. This week, you've been praying for people by name. We all do here that don't know Jesus. Here's how we pray. Lord, would you open a door of opportunity for me to share the good news? You should write that down. Lord, would you open a door of opportunity for me to share the good news? Here's the second thing. And when you do, would you open my lips to speak? In other words, give me the courage to speak. And number three, and would you open their hearts to receive the gospel? Go in the power of the Holy Spirit with full confidence in the gospel, and I'll tell you what, you'll find that the gospel hasn't changed. It's still the power of God to save everyone who believes. White, black, rich, poor, gay, straight, doesn't matter, everybody who believes and confesses Jesus is saved. Let me pray. Father, today we thank you again for your, your word. Thank you for Simon. Father, I, I admit, and I'm sure a lot of other people do, I've just blasted right by him so many times when I've read your word. And yet by naming him and his town and his family, surely you're calling us to slow down and look again at his life. And I pray as we look at his life, these lessons wouldn't be lost on us. But that Simon would be one of those hidden figures, hidden heroes, godly role models that we could shape our life after as we try to live for you in a broken world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.